Hello, welcome to News Tonight. I am Rod Ngonzi. Joining me in a bit on sign language, Elizabeth Nakokoni. Now the headlines. Over 14 heads of state to attend President Yori Museveni's swearing in ceremony. Forty UPDF officers are decorated at Ministry of Defence Headquarters in Buya. While the NRM Electoral Commission urges party members interested in speakership post to wait for guidelines. And billionaire couple Bill and Melinda gets to divorce after 27 years of marriage. Hello, once more. 21 heads of states have confirmed to attend the swearing-in ceremony of President-elect Yori Kaguta uh, Tibuhaburam Museveni due on the 12th of May. Minister for Presidency Esther Mbayo told the media that all the 10 former presidential candidates are invited and the organizing committee is yet to confirm their attendance. The 14th January 2021 presidential elections ended with incumbent President Yori Kaguta Tibuhabura Museveni winning 10 contestants with 58.38% of all the total votes cast. The Electoral Commission declares Yoweri Museveni Tibuhaburwa Kaguta elected President of the Republic of Uganda at the presidential election held on the 14th day of January 2021. Article 103 of the Constitution states that any person elected for presidency shall assume office within 24 hours after the expiry of the term of the predecessor. Therefore, President-elect Yori Kaguta Tibuhabura Museveni will receive instruments of power to lead Uganda for the next five years. It is a requirement that before assuming the duties of office of the president, a person elected the president shall take and subscribe the oath of allegiance and the presidential oath specified in the fourth schedule of the Republic of Uganda's 1995 constitution as amended. Due to COVID-19, only 4,042 guests are invited for the inauguration. 21 heads of states have confirmed to attend. Excellence, the president has extended invitations to 42 heads of states both from Africa and the rest of the world. And so far, 21 have confirmed. All the former presidential candidates who participated in the recent elections are also invited. As a minister, as a ministry charged with organizing the swearing in ceremony, I've extended invitation, invitations to the former presidential candidates. So we shall see by our eyes and you'll be there. Those will attend. Despite the COVID-19 regulations in place on political gatherings, the organizing committee was granted a special waiver to accommodate 4,042 delegates instead of 200 as per the standing regulations. It is a change of government where we have to make sure that we put everything in place. And the waiver is, is a special waiver. It is for only one day and there is no way the law can be amended right now. And we've not amended any law, we are continuing. The inauguration ceremony will be held at Kolo Ceremonial Grounds on the theme Securing the Future. Lydia Chomkama, UBC News.
The NRM Electoral Commission Chairperson Dr. Tango Odoi has called upon NRM party elect MPs interested in the positions of the Speaker and Deputy for the 11th Parliament to wait for guidelines. He says the party will communicate officially and those interested will express interest and have their names forwarded to the Central Executive Committee for vetting. Most members of parliament, including Speaker Rebecca Kadaga and Deputy Speaker Jacob Oranya, are interested in the positions of the speakership for the 11th parliament. There were negotiations that time. There will be negotiations okay. even this time. The NRM Electoral Commission Chairperson, Dr. Tango Doi, says all intending NRM aspirants will have to wait for the party guidelines. We are going to call for expression of interest for speakership. We are going to write to the chief whip, we are going to write to the current speaker, the deputy speaker, and all parliamentarians that we are going to call for expression of interest this week. We shall give them the details in that letter. Meanwhile, the NRM MPs who are interested in competing for the Pan-African Parliament should also get ready. Last year we called for expression of interest and we, our role is to call for expression of interest. The candidates give us their papers. We compile them according to their, its logical, our logical requirements and present to SEC. We actually forward it to the Secretary General that these are the candidates who have expressed interest and then the candidate. Because it's a party issue. It is going to be, a, it might, might result in primaries within the party first to pick a flag bearer. Dr. Tango Doi, however, refutes allegations that the Central Executive Committee meeting to deliberate on the same matters has been postponed. Central Executive meetings are called on notice because the Constitution provides for that. It has not been called. There was no call to postpone anything. If you postpone a meeting, it means a date had been set. I am a member of SEC. No date had been set, no notice had been given. So I can say it without fear of any contradiction. Robert Onyango, UBC News, Kampala. The Prime Minister, Dr. Akana Rugunda, has urged companies to do business responsibly and pursue new opportunities. He was launching the private sector platform for SDGs in Kampala. Let's take a look. The Prime Minister, Dr. Hakana Rugunda, has commended the private sector for paying taxes that provide goods and services and financing social and economic investments. He was launching the private sector platform for sustainable development goals. Do development, but don't destroy in the process of development, because it may be even more costly in the future. So we must weigh, we must measure, we must look at the environment, we must look at the environment, we must include everybody, let's not leave anyone behind. As in of development, the private sector needs overall support, policy direction. The Minister for General Duties and Focal Point Minister for SDGs in the office of the Prime Minister Mary Carrero Crude called for broad action to achieve the 169 targets of the 17 SDGs by 2030. It's very, very crucial. Even as we go down to the grassroots, it is important that we have fruitful and meaningful dialogue. That we are all looking forward to Uganda where the private sector would fully play its part in building a more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable world. The UN resident and offer a support system to apply end-to-end -end business solutions, facilities, and financial support. Enable the youth and the private sector to unlock the potential of the digital technologies to support Uganda's socioeconomic transformation. The platform aims at mobilizing the private sector to implement sustainable development goals. Shade that in Nasaku, UBC News. And the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives and UNDP have launched a national industrial policy 2020 to promote industrialization. The Prime Minister, Dr. Akana Rugunda, unveiled the policy to address challenges that affect growth and development of the industrial sector. And there you go. Uganda's socio-economic transformation can only be achieved through an industrial revolution that enables value addition at scale with a greater share of the country in African value chains and exports. 
This was observed by the Prime Minister Dr. Ruhakana Rugunda at the launch of the National Industrial Policy 2020. The National Development Plan prioritizes industrialization as a key driver for Uganda's prosperity in line with Vision 2040. In fact, the overall fee of NDP3 is, and I quote, sustainable industrialization for inclusive growth, employment, and sustainable wealth creation. As the country embarks on the implementation of the policy, which will be anchored on an elaborate strategic plan, issues of market expansion and regional integration are emphasized import substitution, value addition, and Ugandans rising up to propel the country to a higher level of industrial development is emphasized. But we sit here and wait, and wait for the industrialists. Who is supposed to be Patel? Who is supposed to be Chongwe? Who is supposed to be any other? Why not you? The day, today is the day the unveiling of the policy and the strategic plan comes at a time when the country has made significant strides in the last decade in promotion of local content in the industrial sector through the Buy Uganda, Build Uganda policy. The new policy is therefore expected to complement the notable achievements by building resilient and competitive enterprises. Yes, manufacturing is important and is the way to go, but agro industry remains strategic for Uganda in the short to medium term. I am glad the national industrial policy strikes a balance in this regard. Despite government's initiatives to promote industrial development, there still exist persistent and emerging bottlenecks that need to be addressed urgently. This includes the cost of money, quality of infrastructure, high electricity tariffs and mindset change. Industrialization is vital in Uganda's social and economic growth agenda and its strive for middle income status. However, experts want it to be done in a more sustainable and eco-friendly manner. Dennis Igoa for UBC News in Kampala. And Parliament has passed a law that slaps a death penalty to anyone convicted for human sacrifice. The Prevention and Prohibition, uh, I beg your pardon, that's the Prevention and Prohibition of Human Sacrifice Bill 2020 also proposes the death sentence for those involved in the gruesome activity. Persons involved in human sacrifice will from now on face the death penalty if the new law aimed at preventing the offence is assented to by the President. The Prevention and Prohibition of Human Sacrifice Bill 2020, which was tabled by Aivu County MP Bernard Yatiku, to appeared for the second and third reading on the floor of Parliament. It was later passed. A bill for an act entitled the Prevention and Prohibition of Human Sacrifice Act 2021. Title settled and bill passes. Legislators who earlier gave their views on the bill unanimously agreed that it be passed to end the suffering of children and the vulnerable. Indeed, sacrifice is not only murder, it is beyond murder. And having a law specifically against human sacrifice is so important because human beings have got rights a right to life and internationally it is recognized children are really suffering children are disappearing even grown-ups are, are suffering now we have become like sheep which is a sacrifice in the past but even today sheep are not sacrificed like human beings so this law has come in time the Minister of Finance David Bahati and the leader of opposition Betty Aol Chan were grateful that Parliament is ending on a good note with the passing of a bill which will see perpetrators suffer death or life imprisonment. The Bible helps us. 
we say that wisdom is knowing God. And when we know God, we accept what God has given us. But if we are not wise, then we think this is a curse. How can I get rid of it? And getting rid of it is sacrificing. And this bill should be passed as quickly as possible. It should have been passed yesterday. So we want to thank the Honorable Bernard Atiku, who has been at the forefront for issues regarding children. Even we, when we know that you are going for the sabbatical leave, but you leave the tenth parliament knowing that you have made a contribution. And we are very, very, very grateful for what we have done uh, on our behalf. Three years ago, Mr. Bernard Atiku sought leave of parliament to research on the bill which has been passed. Madam Speaker, allow me also to use this opportunity to thank honorable colleagues for standing with me in processing this bill. This is my gift. This is the gift to children of Uganda. This is the gift to everybody. Now, Parliament has rejected our report uh, by the Committee on Physical Infrastructure on the status of the land at the former Nakawa Naguru housing estate. Now, the House, chaired by Speaker Rebecca Kadaga, learnt that top government officials played a cat and mouse game to acquire for themselves part of the land. The report was presented to Parliament by Sechitole Kokafero, MP in Chifuma County, also chairperson of the Committee on Physical infrastructure let's take a look it all began in 2007 when government entered into a public private partnership with a developer known as opec prime properties limited and opec prime uganda limited to redevelop the land to an ultra modern satellite city with this partnership government allocated 53.226 hectares of land as time went by no progress was made on the land and in 2018, government terminated the agreement. The reasons as per the failed project is a subjudicial matter after OPEC Prime Company sued Uganda Land Commission. The Committee on Physical Infrastructure in Parliament, led by Kafero Sech Toleko, the chairperson and member of Parliament for Nachifuma County, asserts that about 50 acres of the land in Naguru, Nakawa Estate were allocated to private persons by the Uganda Land Commission. The committee also cites a disagreement by the Minister of Lands, Housing and Urban Development and Uganda Land Commission, which has fueled the disputes over the said land in question. The commission found itself on a collision course with the cabinet. The MPs have accused Sech Toliko of concealing information that top ministers in government are involved in the scandal to grab part of the Nagro Nakawa estate for their own interests. If I had powers, I would have sacked Honorable Kafiro. But now, it has become a land bonanza. If you talked very well with the ULC, they will tell even some ministers in KCCA there. They are very the only some people. But the House unanimously agreed to discard the report by the committee citing unbalanced and concocted information. The people who left the UPC come to NRM and imported their bad character. Uh, nobody is against the establishment of an ultra-modern city. However, we are, it is clear that the manner by which the land was uh, allocated was not transparent. By the time government terminated its PPP contract with Opaque Prime Limited, there were private developers who had acquired lease under OPEC Prime Limited to develop about 12.17 hectares of land. Most of the developers had advanced developments on the land. Daniel Mugoya and Gloria Gutavinji, UBC News. Ministry of Defense and Veteran Affairs wants increased budgetary allocation for, to maintain development in the country. Now, the Minister for Defense and Veteran Affairs, Adolf Mwesige, says the ministry has scored above average in 2016-2021 NRM manifesto. Ministry of Defense and Veterans Affairs has presented its achievements 
challenges faced during the implementation of the 2016-2021 NRM Manifesto. The priority of strengthening good governance and democracy, the Manifesto 2016-2021 spelled out five major commitments. The Defense Minister Adolf Mwesije attributes performance of the Defense Ministry on the absence of serious security threats which enabled UPDF to start commercial and development of ventures. Luero Industries, which is under the National Enterprise Corporation, the business arm of UPDF, carried out a massive manufacturing and supply of sanitizers and masks. They trained health workers, the ministry trained health workers on infection prevention control, as well as fumigating to disinfect UPDF barracks occasionally. So far, funding seems a major bottleneck to the implementation of most projects. The minister says at the close, the ministry failed to construct the defense college and the 30,000 housing units for soldiers. As far as the infrastructure is concerned, we could not accomplish the construction of the housing units we had planned for. Again, the challenge here was funding because it requires 3.7 trillion to be implemented. On the other hand, UPDF has supplemented on police role. Fortunately, the constitution allows them to do that. I don't see the, the mischief UPDF is doing in this. The law allows them. In our case, this is our situation. Maybe the, the ideal, of course, would have been for UPDF to protect the borders, which they have done. As UPDF recognized that the LDUs require further preparation, and that's why we are carrying out, UPDF is carrying out extensive training and retraining of these LDUs to ensure that any gap is covered. And after this training, those who qualify will actually be integrated in the UPDF so that they are directly under the command and control all the time of the UPDF. But it must be said that the, the LDUs have, have far and large ensured security. Nevertheless, engaging the finance ministry, the Ministry of Defense and Veterans Affairs will improve soldiers' welfare through salary enhancement and housing units. Docas Mono, UBC News. Meanwhile, the Minister for Internal Affairs has commended police and its sister agencies for delivering a secure 2021 general election. General Jeje Odong was presenting the ministry's success on NRM manifesto in the ending political term, where he said the ministry has performed at 90%. Internal Affairs Ministry is responsible for enhancement of internal security, keeping law and order, and citizenship identification, protection, and preservation. According to the Minister Jejo Dong, his ministry has managed to deliver on this mandate following the NRM 2016 to 2021 manifesto at 90%. This eight manifesto commitment, commitments were augmented by the strategic guidelines that the president issued to the ministry in 2016 September. Ministry of Internal Affairs success, securing the 2021 general elections, enhancing coordination of internal security, strengthening management of small arms, protection of vital installations, improved coordination of anti-human trafficking, 1,646 victims of trafficking were intercepted and 56 convictions secured. The ministry also promoted the role of the NGO sector in Uganda's socio-economic development. The Bureau has undertaken a national valid verification and validation exercise and we have been able to validate 14,000 207 NGOs. The ministry under police has also boasted of increased police staff strength by 10,000 additional personnel, established a police senior command and staff college at Webaja, improving crime control, crime rate reduced from 742 to 502 per 100,000 population.
installation of 3,000 101 CCTV cameras in Kampala metropolitan area, increased police districts with canine services. An electronic register database of all firearms in Uganda has been established. In the period under review, we have continued to register a sustained decline in the volume of crime of criminality in Uganda. Other key areas where internal affairs registered success implementing the NRA manifesto are construction of more 10 prisons, digitalizing the passport and visa services to ease access, increase the number of gazetted border posts from 42 points to 53 border points. Meanwhile, the ministry was faulted for involving the army in matters meant for police and failure to demarcate some borders of Uganda. Forty UPDF officers have been decorated at the Ministry of Defence headquarters in Buya. Seven of the officers were elevated from the rank of Brigadier General to Major General, while 33 from Colonel to Brigadier Generals. Promoted UPDF officers have been decorated with new ranks at UPDF headquarters in Imbuya. These include those who have been elevated from Colonel to General. They were accompanied by their spouses and family members. We have been moving for 17 years and we have been helping him as far as his service is concerned. And we have been, I have been praying for him when he's in and out. Obviously, it shows me that uh, um, uh, my capability of doing some work was very, very important to His Excellency the President. That's why he has. Uh, uh, allowed me to be a general. Agnes Musoke is now Brigadier General, the only female among those promoted. And was commissioned on 20th October 1988. The Chief of Defense Forces, General David Mohozi, challenged the officers to match their new ranks. If I may give the analogy of a forest, the more you are, the less conspicuous you are. But as you struggle for light and get taller, you get more exposed. Remember that at junior and intermediate levels, the army mostly requires your body. But at your levels as generals, the army requires your mind. Keep this mind sober and exercise it to the maximum. The UPDF still has pending cases of promotion. And the CPA is instructed to verify them so that when we next sit, they can be considered. Minister of State for Defense in charge of general duties, Kano Okelo Engola, assures the country that UPDF will serve national interests. The current dynamics in defense sectors demands defense to work faster and smarter than ever before. This new concept come with enormous financial responsibilities and also enormous expectations from the taxpayers. I want to assure all Ugandans that defense will spend its budget wisely. 1,548 soldiers were promoted by the President of the Republic of Uganda and as of today only 40 generals have been decorated. Among these, 7 were Major Generals and 33 were Brigadier Generals. The rest of the soldiers will be decorated at a later stage. Ivan Kahua, UBC News, Atimbuya Barracks Headquarters. In Mutiana Municipality Member of Parliament, Francis Zake, has accused the High Court Civil Division Judge Esther Nambayo of delayed justice in the case he filed against the Attorney General. This is the third time Judge Esther Nambayo is adjoining the judgment in this matter. Francis Zake, in filing this case, accuses the UBDF and Uganda Police for of torturing him during and after arrest when he was found distributing food to his voters. Mitiana Municipality Member of Parliament Judgment, he filed against the Attorney General Phillips. Trial Judge Esther Nambayo has told parties in the Francis Zake versus the Attorney General's case that the judgment will be on notice, although she did not indicate the exact date and time when the judgment will be delivered. 
Aaron Chizazake's lawyer, however, was not happy with the way Judge Esther Nambayo has handled this matter. It was supposed to be read the last year, but um, the first court of this year has ended and we don't have a judgment. Uh, to me, I think they are delaying this case. A reason being, at least now, I'm okay, health-wise. Maybe they are waiting till when I'm being tortured again. Something which I do not want. I want to really receive justice in whatever form it is. This case involves government and eight police officers whom Zake sued for alleged torture inflicted on him when he was picked from his residence in Mitiana municipality on 19th April 2020 for allegedly endangering lives of people by distributing food in violation of the ban by President Chiwari Kagutam 7. In another development, lawyer Stephen Kalali's case filed in the High Court Civil Division against the Attorney General's flopped due to absence in court of the trial judge Boniface Wamala. Kalali filed this case against the Attorney General, accusing UPDF officers of allegedly brutalizing journalists while at their duty at the head offices of the United Nations Human Rights Commission on 19th January 2021. Some of them are the information we got could be compensated by some little sums of money. But no money can compensate for your life. So we had to stand firm and come to court. And I can assure you that I will wait to get a court verdict in regard to the illegal and unlawful acts by, by these UPDF officials. High Court Civil Division before Judge Emmanuel Obaguma has also set 12th May 2021. The date we hear the case filed by Judith Inalukwago one of the Makere Guild presidential aspirants against Makere University. If court decides that the entire process was illegal, it means even if an election is held by Friday, it can always be reversed. In filing this case, Judith Inalukwago wants court to quash the new directives issued by the Dean of Students, Winfred Kabambuli, making changes in the election process. In the letter which was issued ahead of the elections, Winfred requested all the contestants in the race to resubmit their academic documents for a verification exercise, which Nalukwag is opposing. This election started last year in February. We started an election, we were verified, I was personally verified eight times. But either way, like I said, I'm not here to only fight for Judith Nalukwago. There are other students who are going to benefit from this in the future. That the 86 Makere University elections, which are scheduled for this Friday, 17th May 2021, according to our sources, only a out of eight guild candidates in the rest have been fully cleared by the Electoral Commission to legally participate. Deborah Namamonde, UBC News. For that, we we'll take a quick break. We return with more details. This is News Tonight. No one should stop you from finishing what's yours. That's why MTN gives you data bundles that don't expire. Load MTN Freedom Bundles using my MTN app and enjoy the freedom to finish your data bundles. MTN. Today tastes like a new tradition. Like an old old favorite tastes like all hands on deck and all eyes on the prize today tastes like a piece of the action and it never tasted this good COVID-19, Chijakugwa. If we get vaccinated now, observe social distancing, wear masks properly, sanitize or wash our hands with soap and water regularly. Together we can defeat this enemy.
Welcome back. You are still watching news tonight. Now, Uganda nurses and midwives will effective midnight go on an emergency strike over 70.5 billion shillings lunch allowances. It follows the failure of government to fulfill the promise of paying lunch allowances for over 10,000 nurses and nursing assistants. Uganda Nurses and Midwives Union President Mr. Cherop Justice Chiplangat says nurses and nursing assistants have been taken for granted for long and time for action is now. So the purpose of this letter therefore is to inform and request all the nurses of this country to immediately uh, stop working by midnight and go and stay home. The National Executive Committee decided this emergency meeting, this emergency strike, in, in recalling the, the first letters, which we wrote several times. This decision follows attempts to deliver their petition to speak of Parliament. Rebecca Kadaga and their efforts were rendered futile. Cherop says they have been informed that their lunch allowances have not been funded because of not being a priority. This team were very angry in Parliament today, this morning, saying that no, we demand to see the Speaker, but we would not see the Speaker. So I therefore, on behalf and on my own behalf, declare an immediate strike until the government comes out with the, our lunch as by their promises forgotten my country. Cherop adds that government had indicated that nurses should be paid 70.5 billion shillings, but have been informed by the Minister of Finance that they have not been budgeted for in the next financial year. The nationwide strike is expected to paralyze the health sector that is struggling to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic now ravaging the country. Sudat Kaye, UBC. The Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities has made its presentation on the 2016-2021 NRM manifesto requirements showing great achievement in 15 out of 17 commitments. According to the Permanent Secretary, Doreen Katsime, the sector was growing exponentially and contributing significant revenue to government before the COVID-19 pandemic brought it to a standstill. Tourism is making a significant contribution to Uganda's Vision 2040 of transforming Uganda into a middle-income country. The rewards of tourism go far beyond the foreign exchange earnings. For this coming financial year, we have lost over 20 billion in terms of budget compared to the current financial year. However, we are still discussing through the, our committee in parliament to see if at least the ministry's budget can be kept at the same at the ceiling of this financial year. In the last five years, the tourism sector has been able to support national socio-economic transformation and development. In 2018, over $1.6 billion was earned as foreign exchange from about 1.5 million visitors to the country. Uh, COVID uh, did us bad. Uh, we can uh, report that in 2020 we are doing 450,000 visitors. Of course, this is on account of closure of the airports, the big problems we had in the source markets, uh, all that really seriously disrupted uh, the, 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 the tourism industry. Unfortunately, in the year 2020, the performance of the tourism key indicators dropped due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the NRM 2016-2021 Manifesto Week presentation, the ministry gave itself a score of 92%. We could have wanted to do 100%, but uh, like you saw in one of our, of our presentations, the, the funding to the sector was, was still, it's, it's just, it's growing. Of course, it has grown, especially in the last three years, from 2015-16 to 2019-20. The budget for tourism promotion almost more than doubled. But before that, I think the sector was really hampered by, by underfunding. Some of the 17 key commitments in the manifesto implementation included funding tourism promotion, marketing brand Uganda, enhancing wildlife conservation, preservation of cultural heritage, and undertaking tourism products diversification, among others. Charlotte Amuge and Dennis Igor 
for UBC Business. And the office of the Prime Minister has given out iron sheets and grinding machines to families and marginalized groups of people in Zombo District, West Nile, South region. The iron sheets were sourced from the post war recovery program through the State Minister for Northern Uganda, Grace Trinchini. Women groups and families from Zombo District in West Nile sub region have received iron sheets, grinding machines and improved cities among other inputs from the office of Prime Minister. Of Zombo District, this is a community empowerment program through the office of Northern Uganda, which is an affirmative action program established by His Excellency the President of Uganda. I congratulate you because this is going to be your property. The donation is under government intervention aimed at lifting the sub-region out of poverty and the grass such houses. I'm grateful for the NRM government for keeping the promise. Now this is an assurance that the women groups can improve on their productivity and in that the production of this district will automatically grow. State Minister for Northern Uganda, Honorable Grace Kuchin, says the program is meant to help families in recovering from poverty. Frequent support to communities through my office a community empowerment program through the president's support. We support churches, we support uh, schools with iron sheets. We support groups with machines, tailoring machines, with, uh, with the agro-processing machines. There is very minimal processing. Most of the maize in West Nile is eaten raw and is eaten as, as seed. It is not processed into flour or portion. So this should help the, the women to process the maize so that they can easily take portion or take porridge and improve the nutrition of the children in, in West Nile. The Deputy Chief Accounting Officer Male Benorens expressed his gratitude towards government's effort to support affirmative action programs. And as they work in groups, that is when they will improve on their agricultural productivity. So I think what we have witnessed today is really the right, it is in the right direction. The only thing we need now to bring our people together and we will see this district uh, accelerating development as far as possible. Kuishin also promised that more items will be given next financial year 2021-2022. Mutesa Sela Haruna reporting from Zombo District for UBC News. Meanwhile, the Katikiro of Uganda, Charles Peter Maiga, has advised leaders who won positions at different levels during the recent elections to work towards developing people. The Katikiro was receiving contributions from people of Changkwanzi in a campaign known as Lualo Lwafe. At the same event, he launched a committee of five members to lead in preparations for the Kawaka's 28th coronation. People and leaders from Changkwanzi have visited Bulangi and brought their contribution towards developing Uganda in a campaign known as Luwalo Rafe. Katikiro Peter Maiga urges leaders to serve all people in their areas despite political differences. All those in the Kabaka's service to work with determination. Leadership comes with challenges. You only overcome them when you are determined. Maiga wants the leaders to be brave and determined if they are to solve challenges that are likely to be encountered in leadership. I urge all those in the Kabaka's service, the county chiefs, the Gombola chiefs, the parish chiefs, the village chiefs, to emulate the Kabaka, to adopt his level of determination. That, I think, will help you when you meet challenges. Minister for Local Government in the Buganda Kingdom, Joseph Kauchi says, people are willing to contribute towards developing Buganda despite financial challenges caused by COVID-19 pandemic. 
Leaders are however concerned with rampant land grabbing, price fluctuation of crops, among other challenges. Meanwhile, Katikiro has launched a committee to lead the preparations of Kabaka's 28th coronation, led by 2nd Deputy Katikiro, Robert Wagwan Sibirwa, to be held in Inkoni Palace in Ibuddu, Masaka District. This year's coronation anniversary committee shall be headed by which were Robert Wagwan Sibirwa, the 2nd Deputy Katikiro and the Mwanika of Uganda. He will be deputized by OHT with David Chowalabi Male. The secretary will be Omkungu Joseph Inante Gesema under the permanent secretary in the Katikiro's office. Other members are Judy Muleke, Pokino, and OHT with Dalia Nassali, who is a member of the Buganda Luchiko. But they can adopt our members who may help them in the arrangements. Over 7 million shillings has been contributed by people from Singo in Changkwanzi. Sebira Andrew compiled this report. A local defense unit officer has shot dead a first year student at Metropolitan International University in Namungona. The incident happened earlier on Tuesday, Tuesday and it's alleged that the shooting followed stealing of a university uh, student's computer. The body of Ali Matovu, a first year student at Metropolitan International University, was found lying dead a few meters from the university premises after being shot by the university security guard attached to local defense unit over allegations of stealing a university computer. The shooting happened just after university students were called back for studies by the Minister of Health after a year's break off amidst COVID-19. <laughs> The death of Ali Matov has left many of his fellow students at the university and passers by puzzled. Bullets at around 6 17 a.m. They shot four bullets in random. Two bullets first, then other two bullets. And later I heard that they have killed a university student just because of stealing. Computer. Moments later, the deceased's father, a one who had Dallas, Kenya, accompanied by other relatives, reached the university premises and had a private meeting with the university administration and management. Metropolitan International Guild president on behalf of other students grieved the sudden death of his college. My sincere uh, condolence to the family of uh, Mr. Matov Ali, the late now, who was shot dead uh, this morning uh, with unknown uh, security personnel. By press time, Ali Matov's body had been taken for post-mortem as the killer Juan Sylvester was taken to police. Some of the deceased's belongings that included a pair of shoes, a mobile phone and a bag amongst others were discovered in a nearby banana plantation. Speaking to Brigadier Flavia Biakwasa, the UPDF spokesperson, this is what she had to say. <laughs> And business entities have been urged to get experts in counseling for victims of gender based violence. This was during a training on gender equality SEAL certification program to promote gender equality at the workplaces. Private Sector Foundation Uganda and UNDP have met employers of different companies to focus on eliminating gender-based violence. Uh, the purpose of this 
training is that we want to sensitize private companies to appreciate and adopt the gender equality seal and have it implemented in their organizations uh, so that uh, we can have uh, gender equality uh, uh, and gender-based violence addressed. Women have been found vulnerable when it comes to gender-based violence and need advocacy from the private sector to support victims of gender-based violence. One of the dimensions in which it manifests is through sexual harassment in the workplace. And because of its complex nature, it's already so hard to detect, to report and even deal with. So what we are asking private sector companies to do is to put in place mechanisms to detect sexual harassment in the workplaces to respond when these cases are reported, but also to put in place mechanisms of supporting those employees, both male and female employees that report cases of sexual harassment or any other forms of gender-based violence in the workplace. Business companies were urged to get expert counselors, institute policies and create departments to conduct social and cultural counseling for victims. It is a very big problem that has been kept under the, the carpet. So we are trying to blow the trumpet to know that we have a problem that is affecting the human being. Not only women, but even men suffer. We have a lady here, she's doing Uber services. And when she's driving men, she's told that most women abuse them. Sudat Kai, UBC. Today in history. 62 years ago on May 4th, 1959, the Grammy Awards were first presented by the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles and 28 awards were given. Winners included Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra and the Kingston Trio. The annual award ceremony features performances by prominent artists and presentation of awards that showcase achievements made by the music industry's recording artists. With 31 Grammy Awards, Sir George Salty is the artist with the most Grammy wins. Beyonce is the biggest winner among female artists with 28 awards. And U2 with 22 Grammy Awards holds the record of the most awards won by a group. And today is that day in history. Today tastes like a new tradition, like an old favorite. Tastes like all hands on deck and all eyes on the prize. Today tastes like a piece of the action. And it never tasted this good. What does it mean to be closer together? It's taking the last bus home for a surprise visit. Closer together is strangers finding a connection. It's bringing home something much more than a box. It's the warmth of home or the beginning of something new. There's magic in sharing the things that we learn because it's those things that bring us close together. It's no secret that ICT makes learning easy. The strides made in our field couldn't be possible without it. And now we can watch our favorite show. Ah, my radio is my best friend. UCC provides an enabling regulatory environment and policy guidance for healthy competition. We also facilitate ease of doing business in the communications sector through licensing, standardization, spectrum management, tariff regulation, rural communication development and consumer empowerment. An informed consumer is an empowered consumer. UCC supports local content and innovations. Driving the development of a robust communication sector in Uganda is Uganda Communications Commission.
Welcome back. Now in business, small-scale landowners have discouraged, have been discouraged rather, from engaging in sugarcane farming to avoid avoid disappointments in terms of yields. Now, the State Minister for Investment, Evelyn Anite, uh, wants farmers with less than 100 acres to consider other farming ventures than sugarcane. Sugar cane. She was speaking during the commissioning of Bujidi Sugar Administration offices, where she urged investors to desist from bringing each other down. Bugubo Village in Kapianga sub-county in Bugiri district is busy as Bugiri sugar factory works are ongoing. State Minister for Investment Evelyn Anite has toured the over 60 acre piece of land where the venture is located. We are going to have factory or industrial parks of at least 500 acres in every zone of Uganda. So we're going to make sure that we have factories in every zone. And we're going further to ensure that at least in a particular industrial park, we have at least 10,000 jobs. The local leaders in this area welcome the establishment and appeal to the proprietors for quality production and job creation. And when we produce quality, we expect the market to be there. And once the market is there, we expect you to produce more and uh, also employ more of our children. In agreement with newly elected member of parliament for Bukoli North, Anita discourages smallholder farmers from growing sugarcane. She was in company of incoming chairman of Uganda Investment Authority. Morrison Rakakamba. It is one thing that the RDC mentioned, and he said that the president has vehemently continued to promote investment and value addition across the country. And that is the only way that we are going to create jobs. I wanted to re emphasize that. As we welcome the factory, we must go to our people. We must not allow smallholders. You cannot break even with the two, three acres growing cane, because now one acre is bringing in less than a million shillings. So if you have two acres, how do you manage? And you're harvesting once in a year. Everyone here is our business. They are our partners in development as government. And for us as government, we want to support all of them. So I encourage them not to fight, not to, to fight to be a monopoly in the market. They should fight actually to have, they should accept to coexist with other players. Competition is healthy. Establishing this sugar factory in Bugiri could solve the market challenges that sugarcane farmers have been experiencing. Henry Okrut, UBC. On the international scene, Microsoft Corporation co-founder Bill Getz and his wife, Melinda Getz, who is co-chair of the uh, foundation, are ending their 27-year marriage, according to a statement posted on both their verified Twitter accounts. A statement signed by both parties read, and I quote, after a great deal of thought and a lot of work on our relationship, we have made the decision to end our marriage. Now the couple have three children together and jointly informed, uh, jointly formed the Bill and Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Let's take a look. They're worth more than 130 billion dollars and run one of the world's largest foundations. These two people are a real power couple in the world of Wall Street, the world of technology, and the world of global philanthropy. Their marriage comes to an end after 27 years couple putting out a statement saying that we have tried to work through our differences but at the end of it all we feel this is the best way to go. Of course it's too early to say whatever kind of divorce settlement may come about as a result of Bill and Melinda Gates splitting but it will be hard for them to live completely separate lives not least of all because their lives are so entwined through their good work at the foundation.
in the World of Sports Confederation of Africa Football, CAF, has approved St. Mary's Stadium in Chitende as one of the stadiums that can host World Cup games. This was announced when the continent's football governing body released a list of stadiums that can host World Cup qualification matches. The move comes as a relief for Uganda, who were understood to have been seeking alternatives after Mandela National Stadium in Nambole, the crane's home for the last 25 years, was deemed as unfit to host World Cup games. The State Minister for Sports, Honorable Hamson Oboa, had also stated that Chitende is ineligible for the game, forcing Uganda to consult Tanzania about the availability of their national stadium. However, it is now expected that they will opt for Chitende after it was given the green light. Uganda used the same venue as their home for their final two home games in the just-concluded Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers after Nambole was designated as a COVID-19 center. Uganda is attempting to reach the World Cup finals for the first time in history. The Cranes are in Group E of the qualifiers alongside Mali, Rwanda and Kenya. They will take on Kenya in their first game at Nyayo International Stadium on June 8th and the Cranes first home game will be against Mali on June 12th. The 10 group winners will be paired in twos so as to face off in two-legged affairs to determine the five nations that will repre represent Africa in Qatar 2022. With that, let's quickly take a look at the top stories for the night. Over 40 heads of state to attend President Yori Museveni's swearing-in ceremony. Forty UPDF officers are decorated at Ministry of Defence headquarters in Buya. While the NRM Electoral Commission urges party MPs interested in speakership post to wait for guidelines. And billionaire couple Bill and Melinda gets to divorce after 27 years of marriage. That does it for news tonight. I am Rhoda Ngozi, Elizabeth Nakakoni on sign language. We leave you with the weather update. We are still dealing with the long rains, March to May across the country. That is why we are seeing uh, rainfall activities across the country. Um, St. Alex came from the weather center with the weather forecast. Uh, by 9 a.m. this morning, various parts of the country reported uh, some rainfall, like Gulu reported 8.1 uh, millimeters, while Entebbe reported 6.1, and uh, Kabale reported uh, 3.0 millimeters of rainfall. Now, this is so because the rain belt at the moment is quite aligned over our region, coupled uh, with the uh, local effects over Lake Victoria uh, alongside the uh, mountains we have across the country. We do expect to have a uh, chances of a thundering rainfall that will be across the Lake Victoria Basin in the morning. But uh, most of the country is expected to have some light isolated rainfall apart from uh, areas of uh, Cotido as well as parts of Kasese and uh, towards uh, Kavale. In the afternoon, we expect a continuation of uh, thundering rainfall across most parts of the country. And because of this, we do expect uh, uh, temperatures to be quite cool at 28 degrees centigrade to be across uh, Kotido, 26 in Kampala, and in Kavale Highlands, we are forecasting uh, at 24 degrees centigrade. And elsewhere across the globe, we are forecasting chances of thundering rainfall that will be across Kisumu, but for Tokyo and Cape Town, scattered rainfall and bright and sunny conditions that will be across uh, Cairo at a daytime high of uh, 39 degrees centigrade. With that, we wrap it up. Join us again tomorrow, same time.